we've really put this initiative in place to start to inform the junior golfers and not only that the parents and families of the FSGA and on the FJT. One thing I, I don't think we've spoke about yet, uh, it was on the post, if you guys go back to the FJT Instagram post, or if you just go to the Path to College Golf page on the FSGA site, what you'll see there is that we've created uh, essentially like a live questionnaire. It's a Google form that you can ask me or Brian a question about junior golf, about junior golf recruiting or anything under the sun at any time, okay? So I wanted to know, wanted to let you guys know that if we don't get to answer your questions tonight, I hope to, we're gonna do a little bit of a Q and A uh, towards the end of this call. We hope to be done. I'll be done speaking by 6.35, 6.40, and then we'll open it up to some questions. Um, if there's anything you guys don't feel comfortable sharing in terms of uh, maybe it's something more private or more specific, feel free to actually use that form. And, and um, you know, Brian and I will work to uh, get back to you guys as soon as we can, okay? Um, but as we get going, you know, I think the landscape of junior golf, right? It's this fast, fast landscape, um, which, which we'll show in just a second, sorry, um, with the numbers. But, um, you know, I think as we get started, I just wanted to talk about a couple pitfalls and, and commonalities that I see with, with junior golf families. I've, I've been in the business 10 years now. I've worked with over 150 families and probably spoken to over a thousand families and put my boots on the ground at many, many junior events. Um, I think the biggest thing that I want to talk about first is I see a lot of families starting too late and being unrealistic with their options. I do not blame them. They don't know the landscape. They don't understand what it takes to play at certain levels. That's what I'm here to do tonight is help you guys understand and just educate a bit um, and hopefully uh, provide some clarity on, on um, where you as a junior golfer fit. Um, one of the biggest things that I talk about on a daily basis, whether it's with the players and families I work with or just coaches in general, when I'm speaking with them, college coaches, I should say, is the timing of everything in the recruiting process. Um, the timing is everything. Um, now, if you're not realistic in the first place and your timing's impeccable, yes, that's, that's not gonna matter. You're still not gonna be in the right place. But if you are realistic with your opportunities and your options, and, and, and you understand the timing of when these schools recruit certain players, I think you can really enhance your process and really have an advanced understanding of, of how to go strategically and communicate with schools and programs and coaches down the road. Okay, so I hope to get into a little bit of that tonight. Um, I'm not going to lecture too much. I think more than anything, when I've done these webinars and, and I've done these speaking engagements, I've realized that you know, the facts and the figures are one thing, but people really want to know the, the special sauce, right? What am I living on a daily basis? What am I seeing? And, um, you know, what's, what are some of the secrets that maybe um, we, we can't find on Google? Okay, so that's, you know, that's your reward, I guess we could say for coming in tonight. And I hope to, uh, you know, bring you guys to a point where um, you understand the, the college golf landscape much, much better um, once we're done with our, uh, our hour here. All right, we're not going to go through this whole PowerPoint tonight, but what I did want to start with, so we have, um, I'm sure we have some lady golfers in here as well. Um, most of my experience, the seven of the last 10 years, um, has primarily been on the men's side. Um, since COVID, I have transitioned on the women's side, and it's been, it's been a wonderful experience so far. So, um, first and foremost, like I said, to start right here, um, can you guys see my cursor? Brian, can you see my cursor when I'm moving that around? Awesome. In Division One, there's 300 teams. Division Two has 200 teams, roughly. Division Three has about 300 teams as well. People don't realize how big Division Three is, how vast that landscape is. Um, and then in the NAIA and the Junior College Association, um, you have about about 300 teams collectively together as well. Um, so that makes on the men's side that's about uh, 11 11,390 players. And per year, so that last column, as you can probably see with the red circle there, that's per year, you have about 2,700 recruits going and playing college golf. So next year, I anticipate there's about 2,700 freshmen starting next fall, okay? Um, also important to understand, actually, let's flip to the women's chart real quick to just compare that. Um, on the women's side, 267, so slightly smaller, Division I landscape. Um, 
also slightly smaller division two landscape. Um, overall, it's only about 300 teams less, but that that's, you know, that's quite significant if you actually crunch the numbers. So about 1800 recruits per year. Okay. A lot you can learn from these charts. We're not going to stick on these tonight. I won't bore you guys with that. But um, if you look at the recruits per class, you know, does that mean I can be a 500 ranked um, young lady on junior golf scoreboard, on AJGA, on, you know, whatever ranking we're talking about, golf week, and, and think that I'm going to play division one golf? Potentially, but in most cases, no. You have to be inside of that 500 number, right, to, to confidently have a chance at playing Division one golf. Um, and we'll jump into some other numbers here in just a minute, but I wanted to show you guys that. If we go back to the men's chart, let's talk about roster sizes. I, I wanted, to, wanted to open up the conversation about roster sizes and scholarships tonight. I get a lot of questions. I anticipate some more questions to come from the FJT and, and the questionnaire that we created on the Path to College Golf page as well. Um, I don't think there's any misconceptions with roster sizes, but I, 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 I think just generally speaking, college golf teams are very, very small. People don't realize that, you know, if you have 10 players on a roster, you're probably, a coach is probably only adding two players per year. Does that mean they're only looking at two or three? No, of course not. Um, they said it, I don't know if, did any of you guys watch the, uh, the NCAA championship last night? Thrilling action, Florida Gators versus the uh, Georgia Tech Yellow Jackets. That was, um, it had me on the edge of my seat. I'm unbiased on both sides, but that was incredible. Um, you know, think JC Deacon um, said to one of the announcers on the broadcast or, or when he was interviewed earlier in the week that he fields about 20 emails per week for recruits. So, and we can expand this conversation, but just generally speaking to make things very simple, very easy, I would say that early in the process, you know, June 15th, after a player's sophomore year, that's the first time that a coach can initiate contact with a player. Okay, a player, after your sophomore year. Players can initiate contact at any time. Okay, that's, a, that's also a misconception. You guys can reach out at any time. Don't expect coaches to get back before that June 15th date, but they can send you questionnaires. They can send you um, information on the school. They just can't have any recruiting conversations. Uh, up to that point. Um, but, but going back to what JC said, he said he feels about 20 emails a week, right? And, and that makes me think, um, you know, how do these coaches start the recruiting process with each and every class that they have? And how do they look at that? I, and and the, the vague answer or the general answer is it depends, right? Um, every coach does it differently. Every coach has a different system, different secret sauce, if you will, um, it, it really just depends, but what I would just to make things easy and, and make the numbers clear here, I would say coaches like a university of Florida, a power five school, you know, in the ACC, um, in an elite program at the top level as well. Uh, obviously they just won the national championship last night at Greyhawk in Arizona. He's probably looking at him and his assistant are probably looking at over 250 players for each recruiting class starting to file their information using questionnaires, using, um, you know, just, just observing on-course evaluations, um, you know, speaking with swing coaches, speaking with others. Uh, they, they will rely on, on others to get to know you even before that June 15th date if you are an elite recruit, you know, someone in the top 50 or even 100 in your class. Um, but Essentially, it's a narrowing down or a simplifying process from there, right? So it, it starts from, you know, those, those 20 emails a week, there's probably 200 guys that he's looking at, and we narrow it down to potentially just two players in each class, right? And not, and just to point this out, not all of those players are starters at the University of Florida. You put in, in college golf, it's a little different than high school golf. You play five players and start, or you start five players, I'm sorry, and, and you take four scores, okay? Um, and it's really unique in the postseason. We have that that match play component, as you guys probably saw on Golf Channel last night. But but stroke play is is really the name of the game, um, you know, from from um, the college golf perspective. Um, so just talking about roster sizes just to finish this up here, guys. Like people don't realize how good that fit needs to be in order to be one of those two players each and every year at University of Florida. 
right? Just because you're one of the best players in the state of Florida, that doesn't give you an automatic opportunity to one, generate that coach's interest two get a scholarship offer. And then three, be a starter on that team, right? Over the course of your four, if not five years playing there. Um, we won't get into the details of this tonight, but COVID has, has made, you know, a big impact on the, on the landscape of college golf. Um, the NCA gave those, those, um, seniors and juniors, sophomores, and freshmen, a lot of people don't know that they give all four years of players, the opportunity to take an extension of eligibility and play an extra year. So that should be over soon. Um, we're, we're almost going on four years here. Um, and I'm starting to see that die down and, and coaches are, um, not only are they hitting the road more, a lot of coaches are over at the German boys right now. Um, and German girls, I should say, hate to leave the women out. Um, and, and I hope to, uh, I, I can't wait to go to the boys junior this summer at Mayaku and, and girls, um, at Seminole legacy, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken and, uh, watch some of the, some of these guys play and, and talk to some of these coaches while they're out there. Um, but average roster size is, I think, deceivingly small, right? You really break it down. It's about two players per year. Um, there's many cases where if if you see four players leaving, like four seniors or grad students leaving, you might have a bigger class coming in. Typically, you know, just just general logic would tell you that if a coach has a team that's shrinking, in most cases, he's going to be adding to replace those players. But that's not always the case, especially since COVID. You might have some of these teams that are 14, 15, 16 players that are trying to get back to around this 9.8, you know, let's just call it 10 number. Okay. Um, you know, the roster sizes in the other divisions and uh, athletic associations, as you can tell, are slightly larger. Um, so there is actually more opportunity, and, and that's why you see the, the increase in players there uh, in Division Two and Division Three. Um, scholarship is actually, a lot of people don't know this, junior college, they do have the most scholarships if they're, if they're fully funded. Um, and just wanted to point that out. These are scholarship limits. So don't assume that every school has four and a half scholarships for the men. I'm just going to flip to the, the ladies real quick. At the Division I level, the scholarship limit for Division I athletics in women's golf is six scholarships. So, um, you know, I, I grew up um, here and, and I, I contacted William & Mary, which was also in the Colonial Athletic, the CAA, as we call it, Colonial Athletic Association. Um, and what I learned about William and Mary, which I think has since changed, they only had one scholarship, right? And that school um, is quite expensive. So that, that really limited them from a recruiting perspective. They only had one full scholarship. Uh, and the good thing about golf is that we are what's called a equivalency sport. So we don't, a, a coach can split up the scholarships however they want. Um, the analogy I give is, you know, think about a pizza party, right? You can split that pie however you want. And don't forget what happens when you're late to a pizza party. Not expecting an answer here, but there's no pizza left, right? So in terms of timing, which we'll get into in just a minute, because um, timing is crucial in this process. And every, every coach, every school, um, everyone recruits differently. Um, but we, I have been able to narrow it down to certain level of schools, certain type of schools recruit within certain windows, right? You usually have an early recruit, a normal recruit, and then maybe even a later recruit, someone on lower scholarship that was late to that pizza party. Okay. Um, for, the, for the ladies out there, just really quick, roster sizes are even smaller. Um, I, I've been asked many, many times why this is. I've even asked coaches, and I, I can't put my finger on it. There's more scholarship, there's less players. Um, what's interesting though, is that, you know, with, with only about eight players on the team in division one, that gives a lot of opportunity. If you, it, I'm a logical guy, right? Think about it. You have two foursomes in practice, very easy, right? If you have nine players, it's three threesomes. It's a lot easier to manage on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and typically, for the, a lot of division one teams do have assistant coaches, but if you look at the division two and division three level, there are fewer assistant coaches. So it, it's much harder to manage more players. And I think that's the reason for it um, on the women's side. Um, you know, just managing less players, pick, picking your starters, knowing that you have your, your ladies in this case um, that you're going to go with and, and um, you know, being, being set with that. Um. What's interesting here is, you know, I think a lot of people 
think that when you when you play Division One athletics, um, you know you're going and having this experience with um, all other athletes. And if these schools are so large, on average, which just can be deceiving, you know, I think your your larger schools like your your Michigan State, your Ohio State, your University of Central Florida's, um, you know, you you see undergraduate enrollment around you know. 45, 55, 65,000 students, right? And that's why the average can be a little bit of a deceiving metric. But um, on average, you know, this, the average school in Division One is about um, 20, uh, sorry, 12,500 undergraduate students. Um, what's interesting here on the right is a student body chart right here of student athletes is that the Division Three experience which I don't think we'll talk too much about that today, but the division three experience, you know, typically, yes, they're smaller schools, which makes this percentage go up, of course, but you will be surrounded by the same number of athletes, but you're in a more, you're, the way I would say it is you're a bigger fish in a smaller pond, right? That's one of the first questions I always ask players when I meet with them for the first time is would you, you know, do you prefer to be a, you know, the big man on campus? and be that small fish, or, or sorry, big man on campus, be the, the big fish in the small pond? Or do you want to go to a bigger school and, and maybe just be, a, um, you know, uh, uh, an, not an afterthought, but in a way, right, some of these football teams, some of these basketball teams do take precedent, and, um, and the golf teams, you know, come secondary. So it's something to think about, for sure, as you're starting the process. Um, this is really good. So these are just the first quick chart that we can number crunch here. These are numbers taken off of golf stat. These are adjusted scoring differentials based on course rating um, and, and the tournament. But these are the individual players in college golf, what their ranking is and what their scoring average is at that given level. So I think what's really interesting for me is that, and, and, and don't forget, these, these guys are playing a lot of times 7,000 to 7,200 yard golf courses in cold weather, right? Especially coming out of, out of winter into the spring, you know, February, March timeline. Um, and a lot of times we're playing 36 holes a day, right? So, you know, loss of energy and, and stamina and things like that play into this, this scoring average picture. Um, if you look at it, you know, there's, over 500 players that have under a 73.1 scoring average, right? Actually, that's adjusted. So it's probably not that many. It's probably around 400 players. But that's, to me, that's still just incredible. And if you look at Division Two, there's still about 150 players there. So um, just, I think this chart is one that really debunks that myth really quickly that Division Two schools aren't competitive and that even Division Three NAI schools aren't competitive. As you can see at the top level, Right? If we're talking about a, we're talking about players here, right? Top 50, top 100 players. But if you think about it, like the top 10, top 20, top 30 schools at all of these levels, including junior college level, are have players that are just as competitive as Division I players in the top thousand. So you know, if you think about that, there's there's 3,000 players in Division One on the men's side. These are men's numbers, by the way. But on the men's side, there's 3,000 players. About a thousand of those are shooting under 74.5 on average. It's incredible how high the quality of golf is, and it's only getting stronger. Now, how does this apply to you as a junior golfer or um, you as a junior golf parent? This chart, um, and, and guys, I'm happy to share with the, these later on. Um, these are preparatory to, to poor college golf, but happy to explain them today and then share them later on. So feel free to ask any questions here as well. But what this chart shows is grade 10, that's G10 on the left, scoring average, and then grade 12 scoring average. So it just it's showing junior development over time. And I'll just give you guys a quick and easy stat to remember. In order to keep pace from your sophomore to your junior year, for example, the, the player, that player has to get about eight tenths of a shot better just to be ranked 300 that very next year. What's really important, what I say is keep climbing the ladder. And what I mean by that is if you haven't succeeded locally, stay local and play local. If you haven't succeeded regionally, stay regional, play regional and have a good mix of local events in there as well. 
Once you get to that level where you're succeeding regionally, right, within the state of Florida or the Southeast, we could say, then you can test your game elsewhere. Then you can showcase your skills to college coaches um, um, with other events and other, other opportunities. All right, this chart's very, very good as well. Um, so this, this just shows the range of not only class rank, but junior golf scores, scoring differential. So the scoring differential here was the old scoring differential before the course ratings adjustment, um, or the, I think it's called a course conditions adjustment, sorry, on junior golf score was put in place. But I think that this the scoring differential that I use is more accurate because it's simply just your score against the the um, the course rating that given day. Okay, so so these are a little bit skewed compared to the, what you would look at now, but the class ranks are still the same and the average scores are still the same for the most part. So if we look at the division one level here for men's college golf, you know, your best player is averaging about 69, you know, probably playing some invitationals, some um, USGA events, AJGA events, um, your boys junior here in the state of Florida, um, and all the, the bigger events that they play. So that's an incredible scoring average, right? Especially on courses like that. And then if you, if you look at it, right, I said about 500 players, you know, get in. So I just gave it a little le leeway and added 550, but about 500 players per class. Comfortably, if you want to be comfortable that you can play Division I golf, I think by your senior year, you need to be averaging in higher level events Right, not small events, not local events, national ranked events, about 74.4, right? And if you're looking to play at um, a bigger school or a power five level, you know, look towards the top of this chart, more in this 72.5, 73 range, okay? But as you can see, division two level, division three level, NAI and junior college, they kind of pop their heads up here, right? The best players going to these schools are still shooting, 72.5, 73 on average in tournaments. That is so impressive, if you ask me. But the red circles here are the thresholds. So this would be the kind of the threshold that I would like to see you under if you were a player in my program in Division One, 74 and a half, let's say. Division Two, 76.1, 76.5. Now keep in mind, and we're going to talk about this and the timing of things, but keep in mind that by senior year, this player might already be recruited. So he might have actually been averaging a little bit higher, perhaps, but done it a little bit sooner. So 74.8, 75, you know, somewhere in that region, um, you know, during their junior year or even sophomore year in some cases. Okay. Um, any questions on this chart? If there are, we can go back to it um, during the QA session. Happy to do so. All right, a couple of just cool graphics that I like to share and then we'll 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 uh, we'll jump into some other stats and and I think secret sauce some cool figures for you guys look at the contingent of the scatter plot here in division one it shocks me how many schools are east on the east coast and and just more in the eastern part of the United States um, when you really look at you know population maps and other things this doesn't sh really shock me you know, the schools are around big cities, typically um, research universities in most cases. But, you know, you think geographically, um, you know, I have parents tell me all the time that, hey, you know, Johnny can only play Division One golf in the state of Georgia. Okay, well, I think we have, if I'm counting the dots correctly, I think we have seven schools that we're working with. Are we really limiting our options to that? Um, and in some cases, that could be fine, right? If a player has good rapport with a few coaches already, um, if he's one of the best players in his recruiting class in the state, that could be, you know, totally fine. But in most cases, um, I like to cast a much wider net when I'm working with my players. Um, I, what I do with my players, if you guys are curious, is I bring them in for a college preferences assessment. We talk about what's important to them academically, athletically, and socially, and just overall when it comes to, you know, looking at colleges and, and you know, everything from geographic location to big school, small school, to um, you know, engineering to liberal arts college, right? And figuring out what's right. And then creating a school database or a list of about 25 to 40 schools, depending on how selective that player's preferences are, okay? 
Um, but th that chart really does shock me. And then if you look at um, division two here, I would say it's, it's pretty heavy in the Southeast. You see so many dots here in Florida, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, and even throughout um, you know, the, um, the Southwest here. And if we look at division three, watch, watch when I click here, how, how much this changes um, and, and actually um, changes to you know, preferences in the Northeast. I once had a parent say, Mike, we need to find a division three school in Florida that, that has men's college golf. There are none, <laughs> none exist. South Carolina, Arizona, Nevada, no division three schools. So um, I think first and foremost, when, when I say be realistic, it comes down to knowing the landscape here, right? Um, and I have, I have a proprietary database with all 1101 schools. Um, I can sort by um, not, only, not only ranking, acceptance rate, um, SAT scores, but I think most importantly, conference. That's one of the most, that's, that's some secret sauce for you guys to remember tonight is when you look at schools and if you're, if you're already in the recruiting process and you're having success with a certain school, look at the other schools in that conference or schools that also compete against those schools during the course of the year. That's very, very underestimated, I think, in the, in, in, in the college recruiting space. Um, if anybody has questions about that, happy to jump in afterwards. All right, let's talk scholarships real quick. Just wanted to show you guys a breakdown. I think it's important to, to realize like golf, we can split scholarships up. So, and also scholarships in most cases are one year deals, renewable at the end of the year, which most, most coaches um, don't get too caught up in that, but most coaches will automatically re renew that scholarship. Um, very, very seldomly do you see someone re get their scholarship reduced you will see a scholarship addition or adding scholarship to a player's um, um, deal if they perform well. Um, and in, in a, a little bit of, of intangible secret sauce again is families underestimate the importance of laying, even if it's a one-year scholarship agreement and you know that you're committing and, and verbally committing and signing the national letter of intent to go to that school, you should still discuss the opportunity for an increase in scholarship. I've had a lot of players, just to go back on that for one second, but I've had a lot of players um, that don't get any scholarship year one and they go in and they perform and they will have a scholarship increase, um, you know, quite significant. Um, the two messages there that I want to send is you should verbalize it and you should speak with a coach beforehand, even on a one-year scholarship, what the four years are going to look like just to be safe. And just to get ahead of things, I think it's a very smart thing to do. And then every year, have that conversation with the coach. It's very, very uncommon that a coach is going to that a coach will reduce that scholarship. So if you really feel like you've, um, you know, benefited the team, added value to the team, and and been an impact player in the top three probably on that team, then uh, I think you have means to you know ask for that scholarship increase. Um. So looking at the typical team breakdown here, the biggest thing I wanted to show is just a, and this is, this is one example, right? I, I run into quite a few coaches that have very different examples from this. So I'll, I'll explain both scenarios. And it really just depends on how the coach wants to spend their scholarship dollars. It comes down to that. But nine players on the team, right? On average, we said, I think 9.8. So we could have added another player, but we're working with nine here. Um, you might have player one on 85, player two on 80, 70, 60, 50, 40, 35, 30, sequentially as we go, get smaller, right? And then the ninth player is a walk-on, okay? That 0% scholarship equivalency, okay? And what that adds up to, as you can see, is 450%, which essentially is that 4.5 scholarship limit that we were talking about earlier, okay? The biggest thing here, um, more secret sauce for, for all listening, is that there's a big difference between full grant in aid, that's a full scholarship, and just scholarship based uh, that's taken off tuition. So that's another thing that should be discussed, especially towards the end of the recruiting process when you're getting really serious with the coach and talking about those next steps to hopefully verbally commit and, um, 
and make that decision. Make sure you know the difference between, you know, is this percentage of scholarship off full grant and aid or is this just based off tuition, right? And you can see there's a big difference, um, you know, especially in some cases where, you know, if you're living in New York City, Miami, Tampa, as we, as we know, um, you know, the cost of living has gone way, way up. So if you're actually talking about full grant and aid, you're also getting that, that, that scholarship taken off of room and board, books, other expenses as well. And you'll probably get the stipend it's in, in some cases. So um, schools, it, that, that's typically school dependent, not coach preference dependent, but it can be and can be coach preference dependent in some cases. But best advice there is to have the conversation, ask coach, is this just tuition or is this full grant and aid at the end of the recruiting process, okay? All right, and then, and then um, here's, here's the women's example, which I think is important to show, but I also want to, I also want to emphasize that some coaches on the men's side, obviously they wouldn't have this much scholarship because this is six scholarships. If I added this up correctly, fingers crossed. <laughs> um, but there are many men's coaches out there that front load their roster. And what I mean by front load is they will look for the big dogs early, right? So June 15th, right after sophomore year, they're, they're going to spend big dollars especially if you're a team that's not in the top 20, maybe you're 50th ranked and you're just trying to reach and get someone in, in the state of Florida or in the state that you live in, they're going to spend a lot of money there. Right. So I, I will, I, I've talked to many coaches that, you know, they they'll front load their roster and they might even take a walk on, you know, eight, 10, 12 months after that, that first player commits. So another message I think that I just sent there that's important to realize is that every coach has a recruiting window. I don't, I've never really pinpointed this, but I've never seen a coach that says, I always recruit this date. And I always take two players. It just depends. They want to get to know you as, as an individual. They want to get to know your family. And then very commonly, they want to watch you play. They want to come and, and evaluate you on course. They want to offer, in many cases, a, a campus visit, whether it's unofficial or official. And, and then step by step as as that process happens um you know you'll see coaches get more and more serious about uh, extending a scholarship offer or um, taking that next step with you so one of the things i leave all my guys and girls with at the end of every strategy or, or college recruiting communication meeting that we have is the best question you can ask coaches once you either email them or get off the phone with them is coach what is our best next step from here where should we go from here? Okay. Another good question. I, I know there's some 2025s out there, um, even some 2024s that are joining us tonight. I think a great question to ask coaches um, at in this process within your recruiting timeline is, coach, what is your recruiting timeline? You know, when do you plan on making your final decisions and how do you go about finding those players for your program? Another thing about understanding the landscape is, is understanding where you are in your recruiting class and how coaches recruit that, that or your level of player. Um, I see a lot of late bloomers in this process that, um, you know, they're anxious and maybe they started late perhaps as well. Not only, you know, are late bloomers developmentally and performance wise, but also in the recruiting process, they just simply started late. Uh, for me, late is... It, this depends, right? If, you're, if your grades are bad and your golf's just coming together and you played varsity basketball for two years, late might not be until your senior year. But for most players, late is not starting before second semester junior year. Um, I would, I think communicating to coaches towards the end of the fall for any player, even division two and division three players, I think is very important. Um, a, a nice stat and figure that I'd like to share with you guys is Players that, um, you know, are shooting in that 73, 74 benchmark range, there's a very, very strong relationship between, and I've, I've studied this, and that's what I'm trying to communicate here. There's a very strong relationship between their junior golf scoreboard class rank and where they end up going, right? Is it true in 100% of the cases? Absolutely not. If it was, a guy like me would not have a job. And I mean that. 
There's a reason. There's so many intangibles in this process. Being a mature, intentional, um, well-spoken individual is so, so important. And putting yourself out there to coaches. I think one of the biggest things, and I'll just kind of demonstrate here, do not hide behind the keyboard and just send emails. One of the biggest things is asking coaches for their phone numbers, whether it's office phone or cell phone, and then starting to ask pertinent questions. You know, a lot of guys get nervous. One of the biggest things I do with my guys is I role play. I train them to get on the phone and, and ask good questions and, and research the schools that we're actually um, that we've narrowed down our preferences for and that we're pursuing strategically. And, um, you know, when I prepare guys and girls with questions, I think they are much more ready and able and apt to, to jump into those conversations with coaches. And, and typically those conversations go um, much more smoothly. Um, but here's, here's an interesting figure that I wanted to give. The average player who signs at a major conference school, okay, so that's the Power Five conferences, so ACC, SEC, Big Ten, Big 12, Pac-12, that's about 62, 64 schools, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. The average player to sign at a major conference school is ranked 89th in their class. Okay. The average Division I player, so just all of Division I here, is ranked about 365. Okay. So let's, let's break that down. 89th for a major conference school and 365 for a, for a Division I program. Okay, that's on average. And that also applies to the women's game as well. If anything, those numbers are slightly less for the women because the, the roster sizes are smaller, right? So one thing I just want to point out there, if you're ranked 300 in your class, that is awesome. You're probably a really good player and, and you're developing at quite a good clip. But to only reach out to major conference schools being ranked 300, that would be, in my opinion, silly and, and a bit reckless in some cases. Um, cast a wide net. I'm not saying, you know, you have to be a realistic first. You have to understand the timing of things. And then I get a lot of questions about the Ivy League. I wanted to address this tonight in our first webinar, just because I think it's important. The, the recruitment process for the Ivy League and Division I schools in general is very, very different. Um, Ivy Leagues look at what's called a high academic index. It's a combination of GPA, SAT, and class rank. And they typically don't commit or recruit players until their junior grades are in and they do what's called an academic pre-read so basically what what that is is you know a coach has been speaking with a player and this isn't just at ivy leagues this is at patriot league colonial athletic association um you know higher academic conference schools we're talking about here um they will do what's called an academic pre-read and they'll take your um your 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 courses that you've taken so far so ap's ib's whatever you're in online courses They'll take that, they'll actually hand deliver that to admissions and they'll give you not a guarantee, but a pretty good idea of if you have a chance of getting into that school or not. So it's really nice to know that, um, you know, sometime in your junior year, even your junior year summer, um, it's really, really nice to, to have an idea of if you can get in, if you are shooting for that higher academic level. Okay. Most importantly, what I want you guys to remember, if anything tonight is that you have to be realistic in your recruiting process to be successful, especially early on, right? Um, later in the process, sometimes coaches do find players because they'll be recruiting them. But in most cases, early in the process, coaches don't find you. You have to go communicate with them. You have to initiate contact with them. Um, and then secondarily, what I would say is with that, as you are being realistic, put yourself out there. Don't just hide behind the keyboard. Make sure to to make an impact and, and speak with coaches over the phone as often as you can. Most of my players, just as a general reference here, most of my players are making three to five phone calls a week. They don't talk to three to five coaches necessarily, but they might leave two voicemails and talk to two coaches. So it's, it's um, I wouldn't say it's a full-time job, but it's definitely something that you have to commit yourself to, something you have to, um, um, you know, jump into understanding you know, the timeline and, and the expectations and understand that you are not in full control of this process. As a player, you do have a lot of power. You do hold some of the cards, but the coach does as well. So getting to know them, building that relationship, um, understanding what they're looking for, and just simply asking them, coach, what is the best next step from here? I think are really, really good, um, good tips to, to move forward with. 
All right, guys, feel free to reach out to me. Um, we're going to be, obviously, we're going to be responding to those questionnaire questions. Uh, I'm going to open it up for Q&A here. I can stick around as long as we need to, maybe 15, 20 minutes if we need to um, answer some more questions. And then, um, you know, just, just excited to kick this partnership off with, with everything tonight. So I thank you guys for spending your Thursday evening with me and, uh, and, and listening to a little bit about college golf. Thanks so much. Absolutely. I'd like to echo that. Um, we appreciate you all taking the time to talk with us and hopefully you learned something about the, the landscape of college golf. Um, before we do go in those questions, I just want to hit on this uh, seminar was about understanding the landscape, obviously, of college golf. We'll have more as we go through. Some of the topics include how to start that recruiting process, taking the next step towards college golf with the verbal commitment timelines, and including tournament scheduling as well. So if this is just one step of the process and learning about the process, and we'll go deeper into those things um, later in other seminars, as well as all the articles and everything on our Path to College Golf page. Um, but before I go any further, I'll go ahead and let uh, Eric go ahead. If you, I know you had some questions. We'd love to see if we can get some answers for you. Thank you. I, I'm actually, I'll just ask a couple because I know other people probably have questions as well, though they're probably the same as mine. But uh, my son is a sophomore. Uh, June 15th is, well, two weeks away. Uh, and we are anticipating that he's going to get some contacts on that day uh, just based on coaches calling his coaches and things like that. Um, you had mentioned uh, late in this presentation, you had mentioned you were looking at the verbal commit timelines and it shocked me a little bit. My question was going to be before seeing that chart. I know the contact period when he can do visits was, is between August 1st and November 23rd this year. And I do know he's going to get invited to get visits. And so we had actually picked out because now it's unlimited. We had picked out seven weekends between August 1st and November 23rd, where he's available that if he had a visit invite and he wanted to go, that we could go. But your verbal commit based on my son's ranking is like July on, on uh, and so there's no feasible way to do as many visits as he would like. There's probably four or five schools he wants to see uh, in person. And so my question to you is if he does a visit and it's an official visit, so, you know, it's all those power five schools, but if he does an official visit, I was told by people who are parents of older kids who have already gone through this process, that if you do an unofficial visit, you get less pressure from the coach to give an answer. But if you do an official visit where they're investing money into you coming there, uh, that they generally will give you more of a tighter timeline on they need an answer a week or two weeks. So I guess the roundabout question is, Assuming that Sean gets invited to go to those four or five schools, would it be okay for him to do four or five official visits, I guess, between August 1st and basically um, the end of September, essentially, and then still have the opportunity to verbally commit? Or if he does one of those visits, like the second week of August, is the school going to say, look, it's, it's uh, you know, give an answer in two weeks or you're out. What's going to happen there? Because I don't want him not to see the schools that he wants to consider. Great question. I think... First, I, my answer comes down to it, it really depends on the coach. And I think what's really important to note here is it, it's the relationship between the coach and, and the player or the coach and the family in your case. Um, at the end of the day, the best way for me to answer this is if a coach really wants a player bad enough, they're going to wait. They're not going to pressure a player. Um, the, the best thing I would do, to just a little word of advice here, Eric, would be when you're speaking with these coaches on these unofficial or official visits, either one, um, they're going to, in many cases, they will ask your son, how is your recruiting process going so far? And what is your recruiting timeline? Okay. I think the best answer is to give a very general, very vague answer to that. Right. Unless, unless he loves the school, unless he's serious about a program already. And he knows that there's, you know, other opportunities, um, that he might have pursued before, but he likes these, you know, this this single opportunity better. You know what I'm saying? Um, I think you have to give you have to give a, a general answer there because otherwise the coach is going to hold you to that, right? Well, coach, I'm looking to make a decision in the next two weeks. Okay, well, Sean, here's here's your offer. Let me know by uh, August 14th. Thanks. 
right? Um, it's best to say, coach, I'm, I'm still considering all my options. Um, I, I believe personally speaking, this doesn't apply to every scenario, but I personally speaking, I believe that using leverage in the process, telling coaches, other schools you're speaking with, telling coaches in, in some cases, what other schools you're visiting is not necessarily a bad thing. If anything, it's just going to create more competition. So it's a, I think that's usually a good thing too, if you're looking for, you know, a higher percentage scholarship. Okay, so in an effort not to take up any more time of my questions, I know other people, just one quick follow-up to that question. I guess I have to, based on your time, your chart on, on verbal commitments and everything based on typical rankings or the ranks of the schools, I should say, I guess I have to look at our schedule and figure out that he's going to do his visits like, like three or four straight weekends from August through September so that he can give a timeline of the coach saying, I'd like to make a decision by you know, the end of September. Yeah, so that versus most most high schools go into into session here in Florida, right? The first week of August or second week in some yeah. cases. Um, most colleges go into session about the third week of August. To answer your question, one hundred percent yes, I agree with what you said. But don't be surprised if they if they also want to. I guess in this case, you could say drag it out, drag it out into September. You know, first couple weeks of September too, because a lot of these teams don't compete or they're not on the road traveling until that first week of September. Some do start earlier, but a lot of teams don't start competing until after Labor Day. But but August will be a, a, a very busy month for, for the Coltoff family, it sounds like. <laughs> I hope so, we'll see, thanks. Yep. Um, Mr. Biden had one question in the chat I'd like to hit on. Um, he asked, is it true they're raising scholarships for golf? He, he said he heard that scholarships may be raising. I wanna see if you, yeah, wow. there's nothing nothing in stone yet, but there has been some discussion from what I've heard from NCAA legislation about uh, raising scholarship limits. And, and at the end of the day, that's going to be you know dependent on the school. Um, but I would I would be I, I don't really believe anything until it's sometimes these things take three, five, six years to put in place from what I've seen. So it just depends. But yes, I have heard rumors of that, and uh, I'm going to be following that very closely myself. Perfect. Well, if anyone else has any other questions, they can put them in the chat. Feel free to unmute yourself. We're more than happy to answer your questions while we have you here tonight. I have one here, Brian, from um, Amanda Runquist. Amanda, it was a direct message. I don't know if you're still here with us, but would you be okay if I read that question out? I, I don't think there's anything. Yeah, there's nothing super personal there. I'll go ahead and read it. I don't think it's anything super personal. If you have finished your freshman year, what should your minimum ranking be for a division one school? This is the next one. Amanda, you're okay if I share this and speak on this? Yes, I'm fine. Thank you. <laughs> okay. You're welcome. Um, so freshman year is interesting because freshman year, you know, a lot of coaches are, are just looking at the overall ability level and, and just trying to get to know what that player's game is like, right? Skills, strengths, weaknesses, um, what they're like at tournaments. Um, so more than anything, I, I wouldn't say ranking is that important during your freshman year. I really don't think it is. Um, sophomore year, especially if you're an elite player, definitely more important. And then junior year is really where your ranking does become kind of the, one of the primary factors that, or, or at least one of the, the first things that coach, coaches look at. Um, to answer this question, though, you know, if, if you're if you're starting to go on unofficial visits and you're starting to look at schools, although coaches can't have recruiting conversations during that freshman year, I think it's smart to do so. Right. You can start the recruiting process before that. And technically speaking, the NCAA says the recruiting process starts first day of freshman year, although coaches can't speak to you until June 15th after sophomore year, right? almost two years later. Um, I would say to answer this question, your minimum ranking to start looking at division one schools, I would want that player within the top four or 500 in their class, right? Maybe even lower, because if you think about it, the freshmen, there's still players that are playing other sports that will develop into golf or haven't really committed themselves to a full tournament schedule that will surpass a lot of those players. And what we typically see is that just because you're ranked a hundredth in your freshman year, doesn't mean that it's, it's, it's an automatic bid to be ranked inside the top 100 during your senior year or, or that you have any advantage. 
um, it's still just as hard to keep that ranking up, right? Because it's a rolling ranking. It's a 52 week per year um, rolling ranking. So ho hopefully that answered your question. But I think it, realistically, in order to look at that D1 level, be inside the top three, four, 500. And, and I would feel very comfortable taking unofficial visits, filling out questionnaires at certain schools online, um, doing admissions tours when you actually do put your boots on the ground on the campus, doing some things like that to learn more. Like uh, Mike has mentioned a couple of times, the questionnaires on the Path to College Golf page, please feel free to use that at any time. Um, that's something we check daily and uh, we'll get right back to you. Or if we don't, it's because we plan to talk about it um, on one of these seminars. But we're very excited to have For College Golf with us and have Mike share his knowledge and his expertise in college recruiting. So thank you very much for your time and thank you, Mike.